Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. The Lord is good. The Lord is really, really, really good. I was really touched last Sunday after church when I found out that a little boy went home, uh, Brother Cruz's son went home, I understand, and he started reading the book of Revelations. Good man, good man, way to do it. First thing that came to my mind was the phrase, a child shall lead them, and it's so true. I would like to draw your attention today, which I found out can be given to you online this week when the notes are given out online. I'd like to draw your attention to the chart that we talked about last week, but the more expanded version of it. And uh, it's the one I did years ago that helps to uh, encapsulate the whole uh, end time events we talked about in the other chart last week. Now, those of you online may not see this laser pointer. But we have the churches existing right here. We're waiting for the rapture to happen. This is the seven-year tribulation period. And there's a couple things I wanted to tell you about this week that I didn't mention last week that I felt like should be mentioned. Um, at the middle of this time of, the, of the, what is called the Great Tribulation, you're going to notice that way over here in the book of Revelation chapter 19, and when you read the book of Revelations, chapter 19 makes it sound like everything has already happened, everything. And it, it actually, it hasn't all happened yet. It, a lot of it has, but it all hasn't happened. And it makes it look like the Lord's Supper is really way down the road in Revelations, like it's way back in here somewhere during the thousand-year millennium or something because it's in chapter 19 of the book, which is near the end of the book. And that kind of throws people off. But chapter 19 is actually being talked about in the tribulation period, that during the seven-year tribulation period will be the judgment seat of Christ, where Christ, where Christ will uh, uh, have the rewards for those, the saints here on earth during the Lord's Supper, the Supper time. During that seven years after the rapture, we'll be at the Lord's Supper. There is a great white throne judgment that happens at the end, at the war of Gog and Magog, at the end of the thousand years. There is the great white throne judgment, which is the judgment of sinners whose names were not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They and Satan will be cast into the bottomless pit forever and ever and ever. Why that's important is because when you start reading chapter 4 through 18 of Revelation, it's really talking about Israel. It's not talking about the church. In fact, you won't see the church talked about in chapters 14 through 18. Two and three, yes. 19 on, yes. But chapters 14 through 18 is about all the judgments that come upon the wrath of God that's poured upon the earth and upon Israel and upon all the nations and as they rise against Israel, etc. So just keep that little historical focus uh, there when you're reading Revelation. You're not confused why the Lord's Supper seems to be so late in the book. It happens during the seven-year tribulation at the judgment seat of Christ. And I want to give you some scripture because... We talked last week, we read out of Thessalonians chapter 2, we read out of there that those that reject the truth will fall for the lies of Antichrist, that God's going to bring a delusion during the seven-year tribulation. He'll bring a delusion upon the earth um, that will cause people to believe what the lies of Antichrist are. They'll believe in his miraculous signs, wonders, and works, the Bible says in Thessalonians. He'll do wonders and signs and miracles, and people will be mesmerized by this guy, and they'll believe he is God. He'll claim to be God. That's why he puts himself up as an image in the middle of the tribulation period where the 666 mark is instituted. This, oh, that's okay, it's gone now, but you'll, you'll see it on the chart there, that when he sets rule... Uh, himself up as God, this is what causes, oh, no, no, Israel says, no, no, you've gone too far now. And there starts the sun destruction and the unrest that will occur, and then the war of Armageddon, etc., the coming of Christ to judge uh, and to overpower the enemy that's about to push Israel into the Mediterranean Sea, about to do away with her, but he comes and defends her and, and uh, um, um, protects her and pulls her through that tribulation period in order to go into the thousand-year millennial. 
That's a lot said in a short amount of time that we spent a year and a half teaching on Sunday nights. So you can imagine that if you take this chart and you take it home and open it up and on your online, study those scriptures, study them closely. I've had this thing reviewed by other colleagues and they uh, put their stamp of approval on it. A lot of work went into that and it will help put it all together in one picture for you to study. Amen. But let me read this to you from Revelation 13. It also forced all people. Now, this is in the middle of the tribulation where the 666, where the mark of the beast takes place. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or their foreheads. This is in the middle of the tribulation. So that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is a number of man. The number is 666. Why, again, is this important? Should you be left behind because you reject to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior today or any time in the future before he comes? Then you will be offered the mark of the beast. If you take it, you're doomed forever. You cannot reverse it. Here's the challenge. He said, those that reject the truth now, those who reject the truth then during the tribulation will believe the lies of Antichrist. So to say that you think you've got a second chance when you know the truth today, don't count on that second chance because you will believe the lies of Antichrist in that day, Jesus said, taught us in Thessalonians. Be very, very, very careful that you don't walk out of here today without knowing the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal Savior. Now, the day Jesus said no, what in the world would be the thing Jesus would say no to? Well, we know he'll say no to temptations. We know that he will say no to something we shouldn't be doing. He'll convict us. Or if we take something that doesn't belong to us, he knows that, you know, that he can convict us for that. So if you've taken that pen from work that belongs to the company. Take it back. If you borrowed a rake 10 years ago from your neighbor, you go out and buy him a new one and give him a rake. You, got, you, you can't keep what doesn't belong to you. I can't keep what doesn't belong to me. We got to give that back. So if we take something, we should, or if we break the thou shall not to the Ten Commandments, of course he's going to say no, don't break those. Don't break those. To disobedience. If we know that when we walk out of here and we do something that we know goes diametrically opposed to what God says, then we know we, that he's going to say, no, don't do that. Don't be disobedient. Be obedient. So it's not that Jesus doesn't say no to a lot of things in Scripture, but it's interesting to see something he said no to to one gentleman one day. And we find this in Luke chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. And it says here, the man from whom, this, there's a story here before this where God heals a demon-possessed man. The man from whom the demons had gone out, begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. Note the words, told all over town. Let's insert a name here. Go home, leave here today, and tell people all over Dover or wherever you live, whatever community, how much Jesus has done for you. That's exactly what Jesus is telling this man to do. So I want to talk about another list today. Last week we talked about the list of those things that the enemy would love to have us so enmeshed with that they keep us off track. Remember that list? He wants us tired, bored, sickly. Busy, scared, overwhelmed, distracted, discouraged, defeated, hurting, worried, nervous, in denial, self-absorbed, and on and on can go the list. Now, understand something. We're not poo-pooing that. We're not saying something. We're simply saying, you know, if that's how you're feeling today, there's an answer to that right around this altar after church. There's an answer to this right now where you're sitting. You can call on the Lord and say, Lord, I am hurting. Lord, I am nervous. Lord, I am scared. Lord, I am defeated. Lord, I am discouraged today. I call on you. There's an answer to that. 
It's the internal things that God wants to do in our lives to help us to get through those kinds of things in our lives. God wants us to get through those things because the enemy knows if he can keep us in that state, he'll keep us away from the things of God. God knows that if Satan keeps us in that state, it'll keep us away from things of him. He knows that. God doesn't want us to be there. He wants us to be healed. He wants us to have the victory. He does. He wants us to have the victory. But then there's that external list that we have to deal with every day of our lives that that can compound the whole issue. And that external list is work and chores and shopping and hobbies and family and children and cooking, cleaning and pleasure and TV and and surfing the internet and friends and reading and errands and sports and lawn care and church, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, I, I, t- I tell my wife, I said, it's interesting, uh, I don't do Facebook. I'm face-to-face. I'm not a Facebook guy. And when I look at, it, when I hear things on Facebook, I think, do, do, do people have anything else to do in life but sit on the Facebook all day? Really, really? I mean, the, the things that people bring up, the things that, and how quickly and timely they are, they come back. Are you, are you kidding me? What, 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 what are we doing with our time if, all we, if we live on Facebook? Am I going to get in trouble for that, by the way, for saying that? Now, but here's the question. When you add the internal pains, you add the external list, you can start reasoning. Now, don't take, just listen carefully. We can start reasoning, well, who has time to witness? Who's thinking about witnessing, Pastor? Look at my life. Look at my schedule. Look at my internal hurts. Who has time to spend with God? Now, I'm going to say something pointedly. Maybe it's because we're not spending time with God. We got all that hurting going on inside. All that stuff's going on because we're not spending time with God. Because he is the reliever. He is the deliverer. He's our salvation. He's our strength. He's our refuge. He's our shelter in a time of need. So there's something to be thought about there today. This man is, in Luke, was admirable. He was excited. He was excited. He had these demons taken out of him. And he he was committed already, already committed to follow Christ, literally, physically, go with Christ on the journey where Christ was going next. But something much deeper and profound is going on here. A very beautiful, deep truth is going on. This teaching and decision of Christ for all time was being reinstituted this day. Being reinstituted this day. Um, so here's a simple question. Why did Jesus come? There, there's, there's, we only have to think about, one, there's many reasons, but there's one dominant on top of the list reason. The Top, number one reason why Jesus came to this earth. Do you remember? To seek and to save the lost. Bottom line, period. Now, what do you think would be the mission of the church if Jesus came to seek and to save the lost? When Jesus said, greater things will you do because I go to the Father which is in heaven. And those greater things can be included into that greater things. I guarantee you at the top of the list will be to seek and to save the lost. Going back into our town, going back into our neighborhood, going back into our community. I pray for our neighborhood every day, every day, every day. Uh, One of our goals, my wife and I, is, is to see more and more families saved in our neighborhood. And they're starting to get, they are, there are some, we got more and more people coming to Calvary in our neighborhood. We're going for a percentage here, a high percentage, trying to get as many neighbors as we can into church and, and, and know the Lord. And we pray over neighbors. We pray that God will save them and use us to be a light to them. And so, but he came to seek and to save the lost. This man could have said, hey, Jesus, I, I thought you wanted us to go with you. I thought you wanted us to follow you. I thought you wanted to Did you say come? Did you say draw near to me and abide in me and I'll abide in you? All those nice things last week we said that Jesus does want us to do. Yes, he does. But there comes a point in time when we, watch out. <laughs> there comes a point in time when we have to leave Jesus alone and quit taking from him and start giving him away to somebody else. And start giving him away to somebody else. There comes a time when it's okay 
He's given us permission to, to okay, listen, Pastor Kuhn, thanks for spending time with me today. I do appreciate it. I appreciate, thank you. Thank you for obeying the word. Thank you for, for desiring to soak in my presence. But Pastor, you got people out there that need me. It's okay. It's okay to go out there and leave me alone for a while. That's what he's telling this man to do. Go back to the town that you came from and tell them all over town what has happened to you. Isn't that beautiful? The day Jesus said no was a good no. In that sense, it was a good no. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying it's time for us to go back to where we came from and tell others what God has done for us. You're going to see in a moment how important that is. Tell people what God's done for you. It's, it's an open door. You, you, don't, you, know, you worry about the tough questions. You worry about, I'm not going to be able to answer those questions. Yeah, you will, because he'll give the words to speak. I had a, talking to a person this week who told me how the Lord just literally, when she was witnessing to her dad one time, the Lord just came over her, and she could not believe what she was coming out of her mouth, the scripture, and it just flowed out of her heart because she knew the Lord was speaking through her at a very challenging time with her father. Let me tell you something. God can give you the words to speak in the most appropriate time that you need them. Don't be afraid to open your mouth and let it all out because God will give you what to say. And by the way, when you put it in, you got something to give out. But you got to take time and get it in so you got something to give out. You will be amazed what will come out of your mouth. Don't worry if you don't know the reference. Do you know the message? And give the message, give the message, and you can get the reference later, but he'll give you the message. People get worried if you can't give the exact reference, you won't do it right. Yeah, it's okay. He'll give you the message. So remember the not-so-good list. God can touch that. And remember the daily list that, that, if we're not careful, can move God right out of the picture. And move him right out of the picture if we're not careful. Because it's time to release Jesus. It's time to release Jesus. I'm going to give you the definition of release at the end of the service. It's time to release Jesus. I'll give you this much. It's time to let him go. (laughs) It's a time to let him go out of your spirit. I do not believe that we are uncaring toward the lost. I don't believe this church is that way at all. You wouldn't be where you are today. No way. Jose, do I think for one minute nor my wife, for one minute do we think that you are uncaring toward the loss. Absolutely that's not. We know you do care. We know. I just believe that if we are not careful, we let too much stand in the way of getting that done. Now, let, let me show you the breakdown of evangelism. Amber Luff, uh, I do it out, but she put this together so nicely. I give her uh, kudos for that. The crumbling of evangelism. What is the crumbling of evangelism? Well, it's all these things, again, and there's some more on this list that wasn't in the first list I read, but these are just a few of the things that that we do. And you can see that, I mean, there's nothing on here that's wrong. In fact, I got church and devotions on there, and, and you say, well, pastor, how is that contrary to crumbling evangelism? If I'm going to church and if I'm having devotions, well, here's how. And it's, it's a one simple question. What, what are you going to do with this church service today? What is your plan? Is it our plan to go home and go to lunch and, and have some family time, whatever, and watch TV and kick back, et cetera, relax, whatever, and get up Monday morning, go to work, and do our daily list? Well, after I have devotions with the Lord every day, uh, when I'm having devotions, you know, uh, well, what do I do with my devotions? What did I do with those devotions? Were my devotions only about me, or were my devotions about what I can do with what I learned to give to somebody else, see? So the question is, what am I doing with this church service today besides just showing up and having time with the Lord, which is important. Thank you for being here. Now, what am I doing with my devotions if all I'm doing is just coming and feeding myself and building myself up, but I'm not giving it away to anybody else, see? Now, let's take a deeper look at this. I want to explain what I mean by the crumbling evangelism. I don't think we're uncaring. I think we care about the loss. We do. 
we had hands that last service, last Sunday we had hands that first service go up. We prayed with them. Now, and this list, it's an okay list, but here's my deepest concern. That when we go out Monday morning to do our thing, will we think to conscientiously be aware of bringing Jesus into every one of those? In other words, if I'm doing a hobby with somebody, how can I bring Jesus into that hobby? If I'm out in pleasure, having a vacation, having fun, how can I focus on an opportunity? You see, I think that when we leave church today, we should look, go out with the attitude of, Lord, where's my next opportunity to bless you? Where's my next opportunity to touch a life? You know, in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it says pray without ceasing. Now, we all know that doesn't mean you can pray for 24 hours a day because you got to eat, you got to clean, you got to take care of children, you got to go to work, etc. But it means to be in a conscious, having a conscious awareness that God's presence is always in you, always at work in you, and that we're consciously aware and that we find ourselves in that mode of prayer, et cetera, et cetera, and being in the presence of God. Have that awareness. Well, guess what? We're supposed to have that same awareness when it comes to evangelism. We're supposed to leave here today with the intent that no matter where we go, that no matter who we talk to, that no matter who we see, that we are aware of an opportunity that we may have to be a witness to that individual. A smile, a hi, a handshake, a, you know, remember I told you before, always carry a 10 or a 20 in your pocket because you never know when God says, give them some money. Give that person some money. And so you, you, do, you do things and you find ways to do all of that, to behave that way, that we're just consciously aware. You're consciously aware that no matter which one of these things you're doing in that daily list, that even if it's an errand to the gas station, can you bless the attendant who takes your money for fuel? Because there's something you could say or do. Could you ask the server this Sunday when you go to the restaurant? Because sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Do that. But we, I know my wife and we try to, if we've got time with the server, we try to find out where they go. Do they go to college if they're young? Do they go to church? We ask that question many times. But do you go to church anywhere? But it's, a, it's a safe way to start a conversation. Find ways to start a conversation. Is there anything we could pray for for you today when we pray for our lunch? Find ways to reach out to people. Consciously aware. That's what we're talking about here. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't get a pass on this. I will take to dinner anybody, my wife and I will take to dinner anybody who can show us in Scripture where we don't, as Christians, have responsibility but to witness. Show me one phrase in the Bible that says we don't have that responsibility as a believer. And we'll take you to dinner of your choice. And I think my wife and I just saved some money. <laughs> because you're not going to find it. So, so you got off the hook on that one. Brother Steve DeVere and I were having a conversation this week. And uh, he said something. And I was thinking the same words. And as he says, Steve, I cannot believe you just said that. Because I just said that to the Lord this week myself. God's so patient. I said, boy, Steve, are you right? He's merciful. He's patient. I said, I don't, know how he, I don't know how he puts up with us down here, folks. He is such a patient, loving, merciful, caring, gracious God. He's so patient. Thank God he is. Folks, if he wasn't patient and graceful and, and, and gracious and merciful to us, where in the world would we be today? We would be a mess. So let's keep coming and let's keep spending time in his presence. Absolutely, as we talked about last week. And let's learn to get close to Christ. But for the purpose, say purpose, but for the purpose of releasing Christ to others so that we will release him to others. Not that we'll hoard him. Not that, that we'll take him all in for only ourselves. So let, let me prove this to you. It says in Matthew 4, 16 in the Amplified, let your light so shine before men that they may see your moral excellence and your praiseworthy noble and good deeds there's that living it that's that's just living it right now we're just about living it just living it 
and recognize and honor and praise and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Folks, how can Jesus be more clear? Let your light so shine. He's speaking to all of us. Let our light shine. You see, good behavior produces good works, and good works is going to produce more good behavior. They, they work together. They, they're hand in hand. This is what Jesus is asking us to do when we leave here today, to have good behavior. You, you know that honking thing on the road? Versus the Jesus honk. Honk, honk. Honk, honk. That was just a nice way of saying, don't, don't cut in in front of me. Instead of with a look on your face and when you're shaking the fist, that's not what we should be doing. That's, that's not good behavior. It is not good behavior. Laughing at an inappropriate joke at work is not good behavior. It's not good behavior. By the way, you got to be careful. I told my wife from now on, after what I'm hearing in the news about being shot for road rage, if you just show a dirty face, you're liable to get shot today. I told my wife, hon, from now on, you let them in. Turn signal or no turn signal, we'll let them in. Smile. <laughs> Because you never know what's in their hand, but if you give them a hard time, boom. I don't want to get shot on the road because I, just, just, come on. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything. Look at this. Teaching them to obey everything I command you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. He was speaking to all of us who are disciples of Christ. Go make disciples of all nations. Teaching them. Do you know you can teach the word of God before people even get saved? It's called pre-discipleship. You can be witnessing in a way that's pre-discipling. And then when they get saved, you do the discipling. That's how it works. Look at here at Romans 10. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Who bring Good news. When we walk out today, we're bringing good news. In other words, there's more to witnessing than just being. There's got to be also the speaking. We don't need any secret Christian, Christian, secret service Christians. We don't need any. We don't need secret Christians out there. Afraid to let people know you're a Christian. One person said one time, well, it's, it's my religion. It's private to me. I said, I heard about that. I said to my wife, I said, no, it's not. <laughs> Jesus said, go and make disciples of the nation. Teaching, uh, uh. <laughs> Verbal. Let your light so shine. Uh, verbal. No, you're, let me tell you something. You're not to be a secret Christian. You are to be an outgoing, spoken, living, not afraid, not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't be afraid and don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Folks, the higher purpose is to get people saved. You may be uh, jeered. You may be made fun of. You may be threatened. But our job is to speak the word of God. Because it's the power of God. So Jesus is in the soul-saving business. And if we're not down there and helping them, how are they going to get saved? Absolutely. John 4. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him. Remember the woman at the well? Because of the woman's testimony. See, the most powerful weapon that God has in the face of this earth. Satan is powerful. God is more powerful than anything, and of all things in the universe. But the most powerful weapon on this planet Earth is our own personal testimony. Think about it, and let me prove it. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. 
She went into town, told the people what had happened, and many believed on it because, because of her testimony. Number one, he told me everything I ever did. So when, and that's where we get counseling from. That Jesus went deep into her past to help her. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with him, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, number two, her testimony, now his words, his what? His what? Words. So you got to go out today. You can't just be a secret Christian. You got to go out today and be an obvious Christian. And you got to go out and speak the message. Speak the name of Jesus. Speak the testimony that God has given you. And many more became believers. It is important to have the healing inside. It is important to have the daily list that we carry out as good stewards of God's word. But it is also important to take Jesus with you in all of those avenues of that daily list. And look for ways and opportunities to let your light shine. So I have a verse I want to read to you about my personal uh, journey. Uh, do we have, could, could, could I have 10 people that work come down here and stand real quick? 10 people with 10 jobs. Quick, quick, quick. 8 o'clock service, no one came down for a long time because no one had a job at 8 o'clock. <laughs> so we opened up the benevolence department and brought this, take care of all, because the whole congregation was just sitting there. Okay, here we go. All right, 10 people come down here and stand real quick. And... Uh, we're going to, and we're going to, I want you to tell me one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Uh, okay. We'll take, we'll just take this many. Okay. What is your job? Project manager. Good to see you, brother. What is your job? Patient care tech. Patient care tech. By the way, they live next door to us and she does help me, by the way, with my pay stuff. Yes. I'm a student service coordinator. Student services coordinator. Supervisor. Supervisor. Teacher. Teacher. Nurse. Nurse. Teacher. Teacher. Landscape. All right. Now, let me, let me tell you something, you folks. You are going to see people this week that none of us will ever, may never see in our lifetime. And where God has you right now is where God wants you to be. Even if you don't like your job, stay put because he put you there to do a job. Higher purpose in life than just what our purposes are. So when you leave here today, make sure you know you're the missionary that God has placed where you work to reach people that I will never be able to reach. God bless you on your journey. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, if you really hate your job that much, talk to the Lord about a new one. But until then, <laughs> recalculate why God has you where he has you. So here's, listen to this verse. And we know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, Look at that. This is so beautiful. This is amplified. Who is deeply concerned about us causes all things, say all things, to work together as a plan for good for those who love God to those who are called according to his plan, his plan and purpose. Now, I was stunned a couple years ago when I found out that my kidneys were failing so bad that I had to enter into dialysis. So we went on a journey to find out what in the world happened. The doctor said you, your, your diabetes was perfect. It wasn't you. It was perfect. I've been doing good. My, my A1C had been under 7 for a long time, several years. And uh, so the two professionals went to work to find out what in the world happened to me. Come to find out it was two medications I was taking. And one of them was a leave. So... I want to encourage you that if you take a leave, make sure you get your blood work done. That was my bad. I didn't know it was hurting me. So into dialysis I go. And um, uh, God didn't give me a bad kidney. But God is using my experience as an opportunity to release Jesus. I am so convinced that God has put me where he wants me because I am now what I call a spiritual medical missionary. <laughs> That's what I am. I, I, I found that they're taking care of me physically there, but I'm taking care of them spiritually. It's so funny because most 
dialysis patients in there are like this. And when my eyes are closed, seriously, this is a testimony. This is not braggadocious. This is a testimony. I'm praying. I spend a lot of time praying there. They think I'm probably sleeping. They'll come up to me, uh, Mr. Kuhn or Pastor Kuhn, and they don't know I'm praying. And uh, so my eyes are closed. Sometimes I fall asleep because I'm relaxing, and, but most of the time I'm praying or doing something. I wrote a whole sermon one day in dialysis. <laughs> wrote it up. So I call myself a spiritual medical missionary, and I want to start off today by telling you something, that God has given me this new assignment. This is his plan and purpose in my life right now. Among other things I'm doing for the church behind the scenes. I'm staying very busy. But I'm telling you right now, God has given me an opportunity. I believe that this is part of God's plan and purpose for my life, is to reach out and touch these people. First of all, I want to say thank you to all the nurses and staff at this place. They are a class act. They are servants of the Lord. I'm telling you, they are servants of the Lord. I don't, I don't know if they all know how servants of the Lord they are, but they are a class act. I feel so cared for in this place. Kudos, nurses. And God uh, has helped me to have a burden. I carry a heavy burden for them. I pray for the nurses. I pray for the clients. I tell the clients I'm praying for them. They say, thank you. I had a nurse. I walked out yesterday from Dallas, and the nurse said, Pastor, pray for me. I said, you got it. And I already have. I prayed for her a couple of times now. There's a reason she asked me that. And uh, so we have Christian nurses there. One of the ladies that sits beside me getting her dialysis has been in our church since 1988, Eva. I heard her witnessing to somebody. One day I said, yes, Eva, way to go, girl. <laughs> you know what? You just let your light shine. You just be who you are. There's, listen, there's, there's a nurse there. This, I got to tell you this story. I hope I don't get in trouble mentioning his name. I don't think so. Uh, Pet Barnes, you're here today. He's a friend of yours. You worked with him for years. And Ken General Kyle, and you worked with him for years. He brought your name up to me. And, and Kyle was going for his practitioner nurse's degree. And he got it, by the way, Pat. And uh, he's getting ready to leave our, our establishment. He's going downstate. So there's, there's Kyle. And he, uh, he said to me, he said, uh, I said, Pastor, make sure you pray for me, man. I'm taking my test. He kept saying pray for me. I said, I will. So I go in after he's taken this test. I did pray for him the day before, too. I prayed for him. This was going on for three, three weeks. I was praying for him. And he said this. He said, and this, he, he did this out loud. You're going to, this, is going to, this is cool. He said this out loud. He said, Pastor, now everybody in the room is hearing this. Pastor, I said, Jesus, please hear Pastor's prayer. Please hear Pastor's prayer before he went in to take his test on Wednesday morning. And then he was talking, he said, and I said, Jesus, please hear Pastor. Twice he said that out loud. I said, this is so cool. You're getting advertised and it's not even coming from me. It's coming from the nurse. He's advertising Jesus in the dialysis center out loud for everybody to hear. Jesus, you're so cool. How you can take others to spread your goodness. So anyways, the, he passed his test. And he thanked me. Shook my hand the last day he'd be there. Gave me his phone number. Said, you call me anytime. I've been asked about what I preach on. I've had people say, I'm going to visit the church. I've had people say, Pastor, he needs counseling. Pastor, she needs counseling. So I'm going to be getting some more counseling, it sounds like, sweetie pie. But let me tell you why I'm telling all this to you, and I'm going to close. I'm just being Christian. That's all I'm being. I'm not being obnoxious. I'm not being, hey, Pastor God, look out. Here I come with my Bible. I'm not doing any of that stuff. I'm just being Christian. I'm just being who I am. They're coming to me. I don't have to do a lot of going to them. I live by the following. When your nonverbal testimony is wholesome, then your verbal testimony is convincing. So when I leave here and I live the way I'm supposed to live, I'm not perfect. I have to improve like you do. 
that when I leave here and I work hard at being wholesome, I know that when I say something, it will be more convincing because I got the proof in the pudding to back up what I'm saying. That's why when you come to church, you got to do something with it when you leave. That's why when you get up from devotions, you got to do something with them for the kingdom. And Proverbs 11.30 says, the fruit of consistency of the consistently, that's a key word, isn't it? The fruit of the consistently righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins, who is, he who is wise captures and wins souls for God. He gathers them for eternity. You want to be wise? <laughs> Go out and win souls. So let me give you some takeaways. God needs your wholeness. Keep getting close to God for the purpose of releasing Christ. God needs your example so there's getting in Christ intimately. Then he needs my example by good deeds and physical testimony. Then number three, when we do our, God needs our voice now to come out. The testimony. And when we do our part, God does what only he can do. You know what we're doing when we do all that? We're releasing Jesus. So here's the definition of release. A discharge from an obligation or responsibility. Go out, discharge, release our responsibility. What we've been called to do, to seek and to save the lost. And everyone said, amen. Let's bow our heads. At this time, we'd like to know if there's anybody here that would like to Make it a point today to either get back closer to God and or accept Christ as your Savior. And we'd like to have you just raise your hand. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to put you on the spot. We just by an upraised hand, we know to have a special prayer for you today. Is there anybody who holds your hand up really high so we can see it in the service today? Thank you. Thank you. Let me put it down now. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. We're going to pray for these hands that have gone up. And also, I'm going to put into this prayer, combined with those that want to get back close to God. Because you know that it's been sloppy. We call it sloppy agape. Agape is God's love, and we get sloppy sometimes with God's love, and we kind of get distracted so much on that list we read that we're not thinking about God like we should. We're not even getting to God with our devotions. Do you notice on that list I left devotions off because one of the reasons I left it off was to make a point, and there's that so many people today do not take time with God. They tell me, they admit it to me over and over and over and over and over again. What I think is one of the most important things a Christian can do is spend time with God is the one thing they're not doing. Because they're too busy. And they're letting the troubles of this world overwhelm them. Jesus can take care of all of that today. So we're going to pray a double prayer that way today. So those of you that raised my hand, those of you online that have listened in, ready to receive the Lord, get close to God, pray with me. Dear Jesus, I come to you. I acknowledge my need for you today. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of my sins. I invite you, by faith, into my heart to come and to live. I want to know you, and I want to be ready when you come. And Jesus, today, for those of you that are praying for a renewal, Lord, I renew my heart to you today. I know I've been sloppy. I know I've been distant. But Lord, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come closer to you. And I want to be closer to you. So that I might know you better, first of all. Second of all, I want to make sure I'm ready. So Jesus, I renew my heart to you. So I thank you, Lord, for touching these folks today who've raised their hands, who've prayed this prayer to you online and in this service. And we give you glory, praise, and honor. And everyone prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Thank you for the privilege.